Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the July 14th uh, Special Curriculum Committee meeting. I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, joining us today, since we are shorthanded, is um, Ms. Heintel. She'll be sitting in. So uh, I'd like to have uh, ask for a motion for the approval of the agenda. I moved. All right, have a motion, need a second. Candace, you're muted if you want to say. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Um, just for those of you that may be uh, joining us, watching the meeting, this will not be a decision-making meeting unless you, uh, in case you haven't heard, Governor Cooper is to call a press conference at three o'clock today to supposedly make a uh, decision on the options for school reopening set for August 17th. So what we're gonna do mainly at this meeting is to go over those options again and kind of discuss where we are, what the challenges are. And uh, we have a full board meeting scheduled tonight at where we'll no doubt uh, react to Governor Cooper's uh, decision. I just want to first of all start off with the latest COVID statistics for Union County. I pulled these off last night. Um, and just for everyone, there are right at 140,000 residents estimated by the uh, Census Bureau, it's 239 something or other. So let's say 240,000 residents. So you can keep that in mind to do your percentages. As of yesterday, there are 1,864 diagnosed cases of COVID-19 in Union County. Of those Since eight- when? Is that the most recent or is that's that- yes, That's as of yesterday. The end of yesterday. And there are 908 of those 1,800 cases that are no longer being monitored, which basically means they are, I don't want to say cured, but they are no longer uh, considered to be measured for recovery. And there are also 30 fatalities. So those are the latest statistics for Union County. And uh, just some more background. Um, we are waiting for Governor Cooper's decision, which will apply to the entire, all school districts, including charter schools in the state of North Carolina. This is not, uh, and I repeat not, this is a, not a same situation as graduations where we as a local district can circumvent his decision and do what we think is best for Union County. Other states are leaving it up to local districts, but that's not the approach that is being taken here in Union County, uh, in North Carolina. So we will await the governor's decision. He has basically three options on the table that he's talked about, and those options have various safety steps built in. And I'm gonna let Drew talk more specifics about those various options. And an additional option we have here at Union County, uh, yes. Uh, and we'll, we'll move from there and then any questions from any members of the committee. Um, and then we'll basically, as I mentioned, we have a special called full board meeting tonight at 6 p.m. and where we will do our best to begin implementation of the governor's orders. Um, so Drew or Dr. Breedlove, whoever would like to take it from here to discuss the various options that are under consideration, including our own uh, option that we're, we're adding on top of that for parents. Sure, I'll get going, Mr. Sides. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, happy Tuesday. Um, 
So as you are very well aware, and for the public that will be watching the board meeting this evening, you're going to hear us talk about uh, plan A, plan B, plan C, and what we are going to be referring to as a Union County plan D. Uh, under plan A, that is the state's plan of returning to school and reopening, uh, almost like we were back in March before we uh, were in, in this situation, there would be some very uh, some requirements with regards to social distancing and uh, possible face coverings and other kinds of requirements. But under plan A, uh, if the governor chooses plan A, uh, that would be everyone is returning at full capacity uh, with minimal restrictions. Under plan B, uh, the state has designated plan B to be uh, no greater than 50% capacity uh, within schools and within uh, other kinds of situations and facilities like buses. So you would have a greatly reduced uh, uh, capacity within schools, within buses, and much more uh, moderate uh, uh, requirements with regards to health safety operations. Uh, and that would be kind of a hybrid approach where uh, students would come to school on a weekly or a daily basis as a rotation, uh, but, but certainly not every day. Many school systems have presented their plan B um, models. As you are probably very well aware, um, CMS, our neighbor to the north, uh, you know, they've, they've made a decision that under their plan B, if that's what the governor decides, they would be doing one week on. Uh, so kids would come for five days and then they would be doing remote learning for two full weeks. Um, we did survey our uh, community, our parents. I've, we've also gotten feedback from students and staff and principals. And, uh, you know, the weekly option is something that was under consideration. Um, our data really supports a daily rotation. And so we are considering models that would accomplish that in whatever capacity we had. But that's really under plan B, where the, the number of students and staff in a building uh, could not exceed 50%. Uh, plan C, as the curriculum committee knows, that is our remote learning uh, plan. Dr. Breedlove and team, I think, went through that remote learning plan the last curriculum committee meeting that is due to the state on July 20th. Uh, and if the governor decides that we are on plan C, uh, then uh, we would begin the school year under remote learning. I do wanna say that it really needs to be important to note to the public, we have learned a lot about remote learning since the last semester and have made some drastic changes to how remote learning should work uh, come this year. We are focusing much harder on uh, the great possibility of live instruction. Uh, we will be opening up the cameras on Chromebooks to allow for all teachers K-12 to see their students at home um, to interact with them in small groups in a face-to-face -face environment. Uh, you should see a major difference between remote learning in the fall compared to remote learning that we had last school year. And that would be a, a significant advantage for our teachers, for our students, uh, and, and would position us in a, in a much better spot uh, for the 2020-2021 school year if the governor chooses remote learning. And, and to be honest with you, the same could be said under plan B. Because remember, uh, if you're not in school face to face, um, our expectation is going to be that you're engaging uh, online at your home um, or whatever location uh, during the, the days or the weeks that you're not in school under plan B, you would be doing remote learning as well. But our goal is to provide that in a what I'm calling live instruction, or on demand, we certainly recognize that we may have some families that can't or students that can't you know, log on to their computer at a certain time. So we will be asking teachers to record their lessons where possible and post those links to their Canvas pages so that students can access that both in plan B and in plan C. And finally, uh, the local UCPS plan D is really a school choice option. I mean, I, I kind of view this almost like a, a school choice or like a magnet school. And this was shared with the curriculum committee at the last meeting. That is a, an academy model, a school within a school. Uh, when we met uh, curriculum committee last time to talk about this model, the, the committee unanimously supported the options of grades three through 12. 
I do want to let you know that um, in talking with staff, there is a real possibility that we could uh, have enough Chromebooks on hand to issue those possibly to second grade students. And if we were able to do that, uh, that would allow me to open up a virtual uh, academy school within a school for grades two through 12, not just three through 12. Um, so that's a new update, Mr. Sides and committee that I wanted to provide to you that I think would be very positive. And this is, this is a choice option. This would give families a choice that if you wanted to opt into a, uh, at least for the first semester, uh, an option that would allow you to engage, uh, stay connected to your home school or at least your cluster, uh, and, uh, but have the ability to learn from home. Uh, again, that instructional model is based on live instruction, a dedicated teacher or set of teachers from your home school um, or possibly from your cluster, depending on the number of kids who sign up for it. So those are the three state models and then a one local uh, UCPS model that are under consideration and that we will be presenting to the board tonight. Um, and, uh, and, and reacting obviously to what the governor says today at three o'clock. Drew, for clarification purposes, could you um, explain the differences between option C and D? If sure. If you into option C, why would anybody want to do D? So option C, um, option C would be a situation where all buildings are closed. And so what that means is that teachers would be teaching remotely from home, uh, much like you saw in the spring. However, they would be doing again, much more um, uh, live instruction where possible and small group. Uh, the option D um, could be that teachers are actually in their school buildings uh, and they're in a dedicated space with another teacher that they're working with and planning with uh, in a face-to-face -face environment, but teaching that teaching that class live, um, and, and and you would have a dedicated teacher for that group of kids. So, as an example, if you're a, a parent and you have a third grader and you're choosing a virtual, you know, an option D, uh, we will be asking you to make a commitment for at least the first semester, where you are engaging in that, um, no matter what option that we're in, you know, plan A, B, or C. Uh, you would be enrolled in a virtual school pretty much at least for the beginning of the year through the first semester. Uh, if you're in plan C, remote learning, there's a possibility that at some point we could get back into a, a plan B or a plan A. But if you're a virtual academy student, um, that would not be an option for you. So you would be signing up for a, at least for the first semester, you would be signing up for a virtual academy experience uh, that would be uh, a dedicated staff, a dedicated administrator from your, from your school, um, wraparound services with social emotional learning. Um, so there are some very strong similarities between C and D. I think the biggest difference would be uh, when and if you can move from a plan C to a plan B or a plan A, that if you are choosing a virtual academy, we're asking you to sign up for that at least through the first semester. Drew, are you hearing through, and I know the State Board of Education is meeting what, Wednesday? After the governor's announcement to try and work some of this out, I believe. Have you heard anything from anywhere as to what is the baseline of as far as either active cases, surges and or spikes in in covid cases or you know what what is the level where we think we can go from b to a or c to b has there been any discussion you know what are the measurables there has been discussion uh, unfortunately from my perspective there really hasn't been a lot of consensus um uh, you know, there, there hasn't been much guidance from the state on that issue. What we have been told is that we should be working very closely with our local Department of Health and Human Services to make that decision as to, um, you know, when would it be viable for a school or schools to move from, um, from one to the other. And so uh, I don't really have an answer. Mr. McCraw can, can comment on that because he's overseeing our health and operational aspects. But 
basically that would be a, a game time decision and the advisement of our health department officials in consultation with the state. And, and Jared, if you wanna add to that, uh, feel free to. Thank you, Dr. Houlihan. Uh, Mr. Sides, uh, we have a weekly meeting with uh, Mr. Joyner and Ms. McGrath from the health department. Uh, they have not shared with us a certain number at this point, but uh, I'll be meeting with him again Thursday and we'll discuss that. Drew, do we, do you anticipate, and I know the governor could come out with this at, at three o'clock and say, okay, we're starting with, with whatever, and here's your decision-making process to be able to go to the next step. Do you anticipate that we might have some, after he makes an initial ruling, that we might have some flexibility at some point down the road? Or are we just going to wait for him to decide on a statewide basis that it's okay to move from C to B or B to A? Has anybody talked about any flexibility after we get started, wherever we start? The only flexibility uh, that I've heard uh, that would be allowed would be within a certain plan or if you wanted to be more restrictive. So kind of two possibilities. Number one, um, if the governor said, then we, you can start under plan B. Well, you know, we would have the choice to say, well, we're going to, we're going to do plan B and here's the way we would do that. Or uh, we're going to be more restrictive and start with plan C. Um, but we would not have the flexibility to go to plan A. Uh, and in that model, what we could say is that it could be phased in. So in other words, we may start the school year off with a certain number of days of face-to-face -face instruction, but as the data improves, as we kind of get this going, we would phase in more days of face-to-face -face instruction on a rotating basis um, over time. So we would have the flexibility within that plan. Um, the other flexibility would be kind of what I mentioned earlier, which is um, you could be more restrictive, but I've not heard of other than it would be a state decision uh, as, to, as to whether we move from a plan B to a plan A or plan C to plan B. But again, between now and three o'clock, that all could change. I don't know. Right. I know Ms. Heintel wanted to comment on something. Great question. Um, so plan D isn't really a separate plan. It's part of A and B or C if they want. So it's a choice. So you're offering parents and students in Union County Public Schools a choice for next, for next year. If it's B and they don't want to go to school, you have the virtual school as a choice. If you, um, if you, are in A and they don't want to go to school, they can, you can have virtual school. So we're giving choices to parents and students of stuff that they can do under the governor's A, B, and C, correct? That Just is so correct. That okay. is correct. And it is much like a, you know, we've had a Union County virtual school now for a number of years, and it's much like giving those students a choice that in certain situations, you could take an online course, right? Um, or you could take that same course face-to-face -face in your school. Um, or if your school doesn't offer an online course and you want to take advantage of it, then you'd have that option. It's the same kind of situation that no matter what the governor decides, A, B, or C, we're offering a virtual academy approach that lets you stay connected to your home school or your home cluster. I, I, I want to, uh, Kathy brought up something very important in your comments as well, Drew. We have to get a poll after this, this, the governor's announcement yes. and our plan, we've got to find out how many parents want to go D or with whatever plan that the governor allows, or they're just, they've dropped off the radar completely and they're going to homeschool, they're going to do their own thing, private school, what have you. I, I, I could see where it would be critical to the implementation of plan B how many parents are gonna are gonna buy in? If it goes Plan B, how many parents are gonna go with that or go with D? How many are gonna utilize our transportation versus hey, we, it'll be hard, but we'll get them there ourselves. So that will create additional capacity on the bus 
I agree, Gary. I think that we have to get surveys out to parents to tell us what they're going to do for their students, including busing and anything else. Are they going to go to school uh, under whatever plan, if the plan is to go to school? We also would then have to get a survey of teachers and what their yes. plans are for the next school year. It all yes. goes together. I agree with you completely. Yeah. I agree. So this evening, um, and what I'll, what, what I'll announce this evening is for the the virtual academy, we are finalizing the um, the interest application for parents who might be interested in that. And our goal is to post the link to that application this evening, uh, following the uh, the board meeting that if approved by the board, that even as early as tonight, if you're interested in that model, you'll be able to go online, uh, you'll be able to, to let us know your information and that you're selecting that model as a choice. Um, by grade level, by school, so that we can start to collect data on um, within schools and within clusters who would like to choose our plan D. Uh, we also are going to be working on a, um, a, a, all of our principals have already been working on intent to return forms with, with teachers and staff. So we will be collecting that data as well. Um, that is a, a significant concern and a challenge that we have that we have to make sure um, that we're going to have the ability to have all of our employees back as needed. Uh, and the same with transportation. So uh, after this, this, this evening's meeting, we'll be collecting that data. And, and uh, our goal will be that no matter what the plan is, we would, we would possibly come back to the board at the August board meeting with an update on what that data looks like. And if that data changes anything that we're able to do, uh, that we will under whatever plan that that is selected, we'll be able to share those updates with the board at that time. Could you see I guess the other thing? Very oh. Oh, sorry. No. no, go ahead. I was just going to say that I think it's very important to parents um, that we put out there that we staff our schools based upon what um, DPI tells us our enrollment is going to be for next year, and we've done that. But if people don't give the virtual school or the regular school or whatever it is a choice, if we are paid from the state by the number of students we have in our buildings on the 20th day or the 40th to pay, 40th day, depending on which one's higher. So it's important that people stay enrolled in UCPS so that we can keep our teachers and staff employed, very much so. I just wanted to add that to it. Gary, I don't know if that's where you were going to, sorry. Well, I had, I had a couple of different questions. Is it conceivable, Drew, depending Gary, on- Gary, before you start, I ask a simple question. I'm sorry? Before you start, can I ask one question? It sounds Please. like your question question- No, go, go right ahead. Go right Dr. ahead. Dr. Hulahan, so for those parents that do not complete the survey, I'm assuming that we make the decision for them. So if, if you don't complete the online application, then the assumption that we would have would be that you are going to be opting in to come into a face-to-face -face environment. Um, I do know that our principals have, have been more than willing to say that they would be doing direct outreach and communication to families so to communicate to them about that option if approved tonight. And so we will be making direct communication to all families, regardless of, and if you don't have the ability to complete it online, um, we're striving to have a, uh, a different way for you to complete that if possible. Thank you. Uh, Drew, as far as transportation goes, let's, let's and, and I, I know I'm playing scenario here and I, I uh, always, um, hesitate to hold your feet to the fire on a scenario. So I'll try and be as uh, all encompassing as possible. If it is option B, is transportation a potential bottleneck in how we address B? In other words, let me, let me put it this way. If it's option B and we have enough people that say, look, it's the most important thing to get my kid in the school. I will, he usually rides the bus, but we will make accommodations to provide transportation. 
and, and I bring this up because we've had this discussion at my family. If it's a matter of my wife driving him to and back from school each day in order to help the capacity that we can make be work, that makes the, the measurement of, of people giving a response all the more important, does it not? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. And I think that's some of the data that we, we typically don't know who will ride the bus until we open the school year. Uh, and when parents select that, you know, they're beginning of the year packet. So it's, it's a situation that the more data we can collect between now and the beginning of August, the better off we'll be prepared uh, to make some of those decisions. And that will directly impact the operational side of the district. You know, it, it might not impact the number of kids that can be in a, in a school building on a, on a daily basis because you're still capped at that 50 percent, but it might make our operational logistical side of the house a little bit more doable uh, if we have less ridership. You know, Mark Strickland's on the call. He can comment on that. I know they've been working around the clock right now under plan B. And again, this could change between now and three o'clock because things are changing by the minute. Uh, right now, the requirement under plan B is we cannot have uh, any more than 24 students to a bus. Uh, and so if, if more parents decide, you know what, uh, we're just going to find a way to get our children to school and not select the bus. Um, I don't know if it will have any impact on the number of kids that can be in a building on a certain day under plan B because you're still capped at 50%, but it will ease the burden of transportation and logistics uh, with regard to getting kids to school. And Mark, you may want to make some additional comments if you want. Those are all good comments, Dr. Uland. Uh, Mr. Sides, I would add that transportation is one of the many factors that we're considering uh, and that are considered bottlenecks. We are limited currently to 24 students per bus. We're also concerned about the number of bus drivers that we may have when we do go back to school because we, we know that we have, um, out of the 285 or so, we have 90 of them that um, are either 65 or older or have some other health conditions. Also something to consider uh, separate from transportation, and this is something we discussed at length in our start team meetings, is simply the processing of students into school buildings. The requirements are very, very difficult. They're at their station forms, they're uh, temperature checks that have to be done. So it's not just a transportation, it's everything that's required to get them not only to school, but to process them into the facility. And that's certainly a challenging task. Do you feel we have the financial resources currently to implement those procedures, Mark? Are we, are we don't know yet if we have the resources uh, because we're waiting on decisions elsewhere? Or what, can you address that? I, I'll, I'll start, Mark, and then you and Jared can add in. Um, what I would say to begin with is we have a good starting point. Uh, if we were gonna, gonna move forward under plan, um, plan B, uh, I feel very comfortable about the protocols that would be in place. Uh, the state has issued starter packs of PPE, including some thermometers, uh, surgical gowns, masks, et cetera, for nurses. Uh, and processing uh, students through the, those protocols. Uh, it will be certainly different. It will be challenging, but I think it is doable and I feel comfortable about the level that we have. Uh, that has all been provided by the state. We are hearing the possibility of, of more um, PPE and other protocol measures and, and equipment being deployed. Uh, that may be part of the message from the governor's office today, if there's gonna be an increase in that. Uh, with with a special regard to face coverings and masks. Um, and so that's kind of a wait and see what happens at three o'clock. Um, but we are at a baseline, uh, are very comfortable about the opening of schools on that end. Now I say that to say that uh, the state has really only issued us about the first two months worth of stuff that we need. And I said that under the current conditions, and finances, every local education agency and district is gonna be responsible for procuring and obtaining additional items that they may need through their own budget. And that gravely concerns me 
because uh, I, I can tell you all from a budgetary standpoint, uh, both at the local and the state level, you know, unless the state or the federal government provides more federal and state assistance in the form of funding, that is going to be a concern that I have is how do you get past the first two months of school to obtain additional equipment that may be needed. So that is something that we're working through and that I am advocating for in terms of additional funding uh, to address our needs. I just want to make a comment. No, please, who was that? Is that Tina? Go, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Hey, okay, so we've talked about getting kids to school. What happens to after school? There's a lot of families in um, the elementary building that were that rely on after school care. And a lot of our teachers also rely on that, that work either in the elementary school, middle or high school. What are the plans for that, please? So I'll start. Um, thank you, Ms. Helm. So we've not only after school care, but you know, one of the bigger issues that has come up for our employees is child care. You know, what's going to happen when I have to come to, to school, but maybe if I come to school under plan B to teach, but that's not the day my child goes to school, um, what will we be offering? And we are exploring the idea of using our after school care program to staff child care programs during the day for our employees. And I say employees, um, cause it's, it's not just teachers, it's all employees. Um, that would, that would either be in your specific building or perhaps at least in one location in a cluster. Uh, after school care program, uh, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago, we really thought that we don't really know if we can continue the after school care program uh, for an after school care purpose. Talking with Mr. Strickland late last night, uh, he has asked to continue to explore whether or not we could keep our after school care programs, even though it may be on a limited basis for that very reason that you mentioned. But again, uh, you know, under that plan B, it would only be for those students who are at that building on that day or at, or at that building that week. So it will be fundamentally different. Um, and we've decided that at, at the first priority is going to have to be for our employees uh, from a child care standpoint, because that has emerged as a significant need. I have a question as well. Go Tina asked a, she asked a great question, but do we have a protocol for those students that do arrive with the temperature to the building as well as to the school? Do we just send them back or what is the protocol for? So part of the, requ part of the requirement is that um, all schools must designate a particular space for anyone who is symptomatic. So if a child were to arrive to school they're, they're, or, or an employee, uh, that they would have to be positioned and, and almost like isolated uh, in a position and in a, in a, in a secure space until uh, someone can be notified to come get them from school. Um, and so that is a nursing protocol that is a requirement under these plans from DHHS. Mr. McGraw, if you want to add to that, um, please feel free to. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Houlihan. Uh, Ms. Sturdivant, uh, the state in the starter kits, the starter kits did provide some PPE that we would utilize, our nurses would, as we're dealing with students who may be uh, showing symptoms of COVID or something else. But as Dr. Houlihan said, we have to designate a space where that student or staff member would stay until they could go home. And they also would be provided a face covering unless there's an, a reason they can't wear a face covering while they're still in the building. But we do have protocols that the state provided and we're ready to follow. I have a quick question in regards to that, Mr. McCraw. Uh, at one point in time, uh, schools were only allowed to use like the seventh generation cleaning product. Has there been any change to that where we can use some sort of bleach or anything of that nature? Because I know that's kind of getting into the weeds, but that's it, very important to a lot of parents. Uh, no, Ms. Helms, I think Mr. Strickland can probably address the cleaning supplies that we're purchasing, but there have been changes to, um, you know, what we're able to use. And 
And Mark, I don't know if you want to talk about, or Mr. Strickland, if you want to talk about that just a little bit, but we, we can use some different products at this time. Sure, Ms. Hams, we, uh, through our start team, went through and looked at the available products. We have modified the list. It is published on our website. That list will be going to our uh, principals this week in our weekly memo, and it does include some of the things that we have traditionally not included um, we are still not allowing aerosol sprays, but we do we have opened it up to uh, wipes and things that can be more easily purchased at local stores. So there will be some changes made. Thank you. I know that's a concern for a lot of parents as well. Yeah. Drew or uh, Mark, uh, this question we have served what are we up to so far as far as serving meals over the uh when, back in march and over the summer what's the latest number Do you know i don't that? i don't have it right here in front of me i can tell you that we have dropped off substantially i know that when we first started doing this we were i don't know 3500 3600 a day I think we may be down to a thousand or less per day now. Um, but if you'll give me a minute, I'll try to get that. Well, the, the reason I bring that up is there are too many of our students that rely on breakfast at school and a free and reduced lunch uh, as, you know, their the best meals of the day. Are there any plans or any possibility either under plan B or C that we're able to make those re those meals available to the students that are not coming in on, on uh, their B day, if it's B, uh, on their, their day to be in the classroom, will there be any opportunity to provide meals for those other students who are not in class that day? Sure, great question. I can tell you that's a question that has been asked often of DPI and our school nutrition people up there. We are waiting on a waiver from the uh, Department of Agriculture that we're hoping we'll get. And that waiver would allow us to uh, cast a broader net in terms of who we're able to feed um, currently uh, they have not responded to the waiver. We're not the only school district that has asked for that. Um, if we get that waiver, we are working on a plan to open up some additional sites strategically throughout the county in order to provide some grab-and-go meals. But as it stands right now, we don't have that waiver, and trust me, we've asked for it. Okay. Um, as someone myself that particularly enjoys football in the fall. Drew, can you address how the, the decision-making process for high school fall sports? It is not a Union County call, correct? We are following the, the guidance and the requirements of the North Carolina High School Athletic Association. And at their latest briefing, uh, they communicated that they were waiting for the governor's decision. And, you know, I think a lot of folks want to know, are we having fall sports next year? Uh, we have a little bit greater control on middle school sports, uh, but at the high school level, we are following the, the requirements and the guidance from the NCH SSA. So uh, a lot is still up in the air with that. Um, you know, I will say that we started our volunteer, volu volunteer voluntary summer uh, workout program last week. Uh, under very strict requirements, uh, all outdoors uh, with, with small groups, and that has gone very well to date. Uh, but, you know, if, if someone were to ask me, are we having fall sports next year? I think that's going to be a TBD. No one really knows yet, and we're awaiting that guidance from the state. Okay. Um, since well, this I think it's important to know that any of this and all of this could change drastically at any given point in time. And I know we're going to cover all this information again at tonight's full board meeting. Um, is there anything else specifically, Dr. Houlihan, or staff that needs to be pointed out um, about the specific schedule? 
we're we're still finalizing a specific schedule under plan b and we'll be prepared to report out that final decision this evening um what i will say is uh i think you, you make a great point in the sense that I, I keep telling our folks um the word i'm using is nimble right we are going to have to be nimble and flexible in the coming school year it will be different than any other year that you can imagine and uh and you may wake up one day under plan B and it's your day or week to go to school. And then the next week you wake up and you're under plan C. Uh, so that flexibility and that adjustment on a daily and weekly basis is very likely uh, given the state of uncertainty that we all have about school next year. And I, and I really want to be upfront about that because that is going to have to be a, a mind shift and a different level of expectations that we have for both families uh, and employees and students. So I uh, thank you for bringing that up. I, uh, this is not a uh, for action item. We don't have any action items, this is information. But tonight, I would like to ask that staff do whatever it takes to maintain Wolf School opening under uh, plan A, if you will, for those students that uh, it is determined by staff and by parents that they are physically not at risk by attending school. And if that means we need to utilize more facility space, um, then I would encourage that. But I th I've been had several Wolf parents reach out to me and are very concerned about how um, their child has regressed in a virtual environment. It's, it's very challenging, uh, to say the least, for a, our, our Wolf students to really thrive in a virtual environment. So I would hope that we can make arrangements again for those that is determined to be a safe physical condition can uh, stay Full, attend class full time at Wolf, and if it possible, uh, South Providence as well. Our specialty schools, if there could be some some accommodation for them, and I just want to throw that out there that I will I will be um, you know making that at the full board meeting. Yeah, we're we're exploring that. Um, if I have an answer this evening, I'll let you all know. Uh, but you know where we have a situation where you have a smaller school in terms of the number of students that attend compared to their the size of that building and smaller classrooms to begin with, uh, that may be a possibility even under plan B. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to look into that idea, Mr. Sides. That's all the questions I have. Do any of the other board members or staff have any other comments that they would like to offer other than Stay tuned for at three o'clock today to see where hopefully get some direction. Any, um, any questions? More questions, but I'm going to wait for tonight's presentation to see if they're answered then. Likewise. Mr. Ruth, Sides, uh, through yesterday, we have served uh, just over 225,000 meals. That's since March 17th. That's outstanding. I want to thank staff and our SROs that have pitched in, our food service folks that have pitched in to um, provide the, these to, to our uh, children. That's a great job. I, I want to commend all our staff. Um, I, I probably don't fully um, appreciate the challenges that are being thrown out here. There's no model to follow in uh, what's going on these days. There are more questions than answers. Um, you know, I'm hopeful we'll at least get an answer where we're going to start and what the criteria is for our end goal, which I think is everybody's end goal, is to get the kids back in school, staff back in school full time in a safe environment. And we got to figure out what that looks like, and we got to figure out how to get there. And hopefully today we'll find out where we're starting. But I want to commend staff for trying to make 
some kind of resemblance of uh, educating our kids in this turmoil that hit us since what, March 13th, uh, when I think we went out for the water issue and then it completely blew up in the virus issue. I just uh, can't imagine trying to scramble at the last minute and completely reinvent education uh, for our students. And I know parents have very strong opinions about what we ought to do and have many, many questions and it has created a hardship for them. But we are working, doing our best to work within the guidelines that we are given or, or commanded and try and provide some uh, education for these kids until we can get back to a, a normal, whatever that turns out to be. So I wanna thank staff all of staff, and please um, forward my my thoughts to everyone that I know you've been scrambling and trying to figure this thing out. And uh, we'll we'll have a clearer picture today of what it's going to look like, at least from the start, and how we're going to address it. And then we're all just going to have to do our part to clamp this thing down and uh, figure out where we have to be in order to get these kids back in the building, and our staff back in the building, full time in a safe environment. And that's, that's my thoughts. Any, any other thoughts from anybody on the, on the committee or staff? I, I'll just say I agree and thank you. Uh, thank you to the board for your support. That means a lot, not just for our senior team, but also for our principals, our teachers, our support staff. Uh, there have been a lot of folks trying to come together to work on how to successfully reopen in the fall, whatever that's going to look like. So thank you for your words of encouragement and for your support. And we look forward to presenting our, our final plan this evening. Okay. Our next regular meeting is scheduled for July 30th, unless another special meeting is required to react to the uh, governor's um, mandates. As we find out today, we will, um, if necessary, have, the, have our meeting on July 30th. If there's no other business to come before the committee, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I have a motion, need a second. Second. Have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.